Hello, this is the August 31st Beehive call. So far we have Jan, Daniel, myself, Michael, and others will probably trickle in. I have some Euro Beehive Pond news. We have a room and I'll need to do some fundraising for the 250 euro cost for that. And based on several conversations, we're thinking to do some lab work with uh, on-site and remote labs to validate FreeBSD for the upcoming 14 release. And just before starting, we touched on NFS as a backing store. So let's explore that together. Uh, Santiago might be able to drop in, but he has done that in the past, but he's trying it as a proof of concept with Beehive. So uh, Jan, go ahead and lead off. You were saying, hey, NFS was never for block storage is that a mismatch in record sizes or no, network frames or anything uh, go ahead it's just uh, it can work it can perform it's just that you're layering lots of stuff and we re reusing stuff in ways they weren't originally intended to be used so and i wasn't thinking about the vmware special case but about configuring freebsd and beehive in such a way to do it Mm -hmm. It would just be a unnecessary complication because uh, we have better tools in base for iSCARS event for NFS and image handling. Okay, well, I'll share my, I'll save my opinions for now. Daniel, you say you're doing iSCSI per VM. Is that from within the VM or the host as the VM's backing store? The host uh, connects to the iSCSI volume and then that shares uh geez i forget if i'm doing it probably is evil knowing me <laughs> but uh yeah i'll have to i'll have to check to see how I'm, how i'm doing that um but yeah but i'm open to i'm open to standardization like what's the like i guess i guess if it's i guess if the you know the source is ZFS, then I'm probably wasting a lot of bits over the wire connecting to the iSCSI volume. So like, what's the, what's the right match of, you know, of file systems to iSCSI uh, to get that to the VM as efficiently as possible? You recall if you adjusted uh, vault block size or anything, or did you go with the defaults? I went with the defaults, but I only used it for um, pretty much just, so the situation that I run into that I need Beehive is uh, there's some sort of compliance work that I need to do that for whatever reason absolutely necessarily needs Outlook, Microsoft Outlook. Um, so, uh, so therefore I make a Windows um, Windows VM, I need the Windows VM to perform, and then I've got uh, most of my HDVs on another box. So that's so that's the setup. Now, Windows could also directly attach to iSCSI, so that's a possibility too. Um, so yeah, so I, I think that I, I'm definitely open to the right way to do this. I've definitely done it the wrong way. Well, and one quick point there, Windows has a really good history with iSCSI and Fiber Channel because SMB was so terrible. So I've seen people reboot their backing storage and Windows didn't care, even if it was booted off it. So there are legends like that. And welcome, John. Um, John, we so, were easing into uh, the state of NFS versus iSCSI with Beehive in 2023 and onward. Go ahead, John. So... Um... I think the most compatible way would be to not boot NF from uh, iSCSI inside the guest, but have the host handle the block storage so that you have some kind of direct access to block storage inside the guest because otherwise you have to modify each guest in such a way that it knows how to boot from network storage in your bespoke environment. It's easier to do that once in the uh, host. Um, we can do iSCSI with uh, iSCSI D and so on. Then you get access to it via CTL and can pass it to the VitIO um, uh, SCSI uh, 
guest by was so the guest just boots of vid.io SCSI, which is commonly supported these days. And you can hot plug even new ports. Of course, you have to deal with CTL, but uh, yeah. Sure. Uh, yeah, I do exactly, exactly the same except uh, NVMe driver on that guest. Yeah. It, it's been a little more flexible for me. Okay, I found the VidIO SCSI driver by far the most flexible one. Flexible or performant? Uh, flexible and performance is no worse than the other ones. Okay. No way. NVMe eats, eats the lunch of the yeah, and the it depends on the guest. NVMe for Windows? Yes. You're right about that. The Windows driver for NVMe is so much faster than the VidIO SCSI driver. That's a good right, point. So I, have to, I have to race my Linux box and see what happens. So, so you think stick to... I mean, I guess the we I've, I've definitely tested trim and all that stuff, and and they they definitely function equivalently as as far as I can tell in Linux. Um, but I haven't I've haven't done benchmarking only only. It Windows. could also be that uh, my lap is too small and too slow to uh, because I'm just running off two SATA SSDs. That does raise a good question on the status of hole punching slash trim slash what's the other term for it but uh discard on nfs and say disk images so uh, i think it's all working but that definitely needs to be verified yeah, there's been some good work on that lately yeah. so John, any news on your either LibNFS client within Beehive or is, would it be, if that goes beautifully, would it be wise to have an NF, an iSCSI client within Beehive itself such that one VM can reach out without impacting the host in any way? I guess that would be an initiator. Um. The answer to that is is yes. Um, it, it can, however, already be done with I, IPXE and uh, the SAN boot uh, process. In user and space the, or? In um, user space in inside the game. Sorry. It is a, IPXE is loaded via a, well, the way I do it, is loaded via a uh, DHCP specification. IPXE loads, I load up a, uh, I then dynamically load up a IPXE script, and that script then goes out and locates the appropriate uh, iSCSI uh, back end and uh, uses the, the MAC address of the system I'm booting to do that, um, and then brings that forward and uses the SAN boot protocol to boot from it. And with guest operating systems, support the handoff? Um, I'm using Linux right now, and it's built into their, uh, or Red Hat anyways. Um, the others have it too. Um, so the VM effectively boots with iPixie? Yes, absolutely. Uh, do you have the napkin notes related to that? And are you I able to might, post them? I can probably give you a short write up and send it to you that later. That would be awesome. Thank you. Appreciate it. And then, by that same logic, do you think it would be wise to have? And remember, in the good, well, I guess the the free BSD ice does the initiator is, I assume, still in user space, but it has a daemon. But could that be in the Beehive process? It's a bit different. It works through the cam layer and the initiator part, but the, the handshake is delegated from the kernel to a daemon, but the actual iSCSI processing happens inside the kernel, only the handshake is... Yeah, that's correct. ...space, so we have good 
performance and the flexibility and all of the annoying complexity of the iSCSI state machines gets passed to user space. Uh, if I remember correctly, there was an IS boot kernel module and ports, which never was upstreamed into base. Correct. Uh, oh, right. Yes. From Japan. That's the problem if you want to uh, hand it off from an option ROM, because you're basically, the kernel has to take over the existing iSCSI uh, session. And um, yeah, this kernel module has. I think Process what we're referring to is IBFT. Ten and twelve, and maybe it has already uh, has been fixed again for thirteen, and then I don't know about fourteen, but it tends to break when the network stack changes. You have a link to any of those references, Jana? And John, you said IBFT. Not yeah, the correct. process is typically referred to as IBFT. Yeah. That's a new one. So thank you, Jan. And it is worth noting that I can do this over the virtual NIC or TAP, but I typically do this over a um, SRIOV uh, VF. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the IPXE, they have a number of uh, drivers that they they have built in that they support, and it works quite well. So there's a driver in iPixie that's specific to say a VF instance in a mix yes, correct. Of Interesting, nice. John, may I cut in with a bit of a ten thousand foot overview of the boot Absolutely. process? Absolutely. So Michael, where you're probably lost is that there are a few more indirections in the process John described than usual, even in uh, X sixty eight boot. So basically what happens is the Inside Beehive, the boot ROM you pass in using UEFI boots or starts the boot process. It uh, finds via DHCP that it's supposed to load via TFTP or HTTP IPXE. Then it loads IPXE into RAM. IPXE again via DHCP options or hard configuration knows uh, the next step, which is then using this network loaded basically option ROM to um, set up an iSCSI session and then continue booting from there. The problem is that this basically gets you to the through the bootloader because the bootloader will use the, these kinds of steps but afterward the kernel is now loaded starts executing and say, sees oh there are no local direct attached storage devices Oh, wait, there in this magic table, there's a node uh, that I'm supposed to have an established iSCSI session. So yep. I have create, set up a socket with these parameters and treat it as part and basically continue the TCP connection. And then, or maybe reconnect to the same, but yeah, anyway. And then you have to pass the credentials. It's really no nasty, but it works. And I threw in a link to the kernel module. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I put those in up here. Which is the problem again. If you lose all of this, and because of this, I basically prefer to have the um, iSCSI client on the Beehive host and hide the iSCSI stuff from the guest. Make it available via sure. CTR. Again, on a per VM yeah. basis, or by having a very large SAN that 50 VMs connect to, and then you get them um, that's the completely orthogonal. Uh, you can do it any way you want. You can. Oh, have... you can, but I'm just speaking from scars here. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Um... I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. I do think Jan that you and I uh, probably implement this a little bit uh, opposite. I tend to like to have the I.O. channels for a VM isolated from the actual hypervisor. Um, and I, I think when I hear you talk, you like to use the hypervisor I.O. capabilities to feed into the VM. Because yeah, I, I want to keep the VMs as dumb as possible. 
Because no, 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 I, I simply think you, you and I are probably solving for two different types of problems. Yep. I don't typically have network issues. For, um, I do have performance issues that I am always chasing down. Sure. <laughs> and if you can pass through an, a, NIC, a virtual function of a NIC with hardware iSCSI offloading, of course, you get vastly better performance. Yes. Especially if you have a guest operating system with proper multipath support. Which, if I remember correctly, Windows, even in recent desktop versions, does, right? Okay. Jan, I didn't get all those steps documented. Uh, maybe I can pull them from the recording or you can punch them in there. But that is appreciated. Uh, anything else on this topic? And Daniel, I know you had the broader question and maybe we can screw around in Portugal with this. Because a key thing is what not to do. So let's establish that and then work on fine tuning not performance. Just, on, um, yes. What not to do, but why not to do? Right. Right. So, yeah, I mean, for iSCSI, I guess it's it's the same question as, uh, you know, a VM running ZFS or whatever on top of uh, storage that's that's ZFS or whatever. And I think it's the same exact calculation that goes into whether the source for your iSCSI is, you know, is, is ZFS backed, and then that'll just that'll decide what you do, um, you know, from the from the initiator. So regarding sure. nesting ZFS inside Beehive and on the host, um, I prefer to do only ZFS on the uh, host. And then snapshots were backing uh, Z vaults and just run UFS inside the uh, FreeBSD guests or whatever native file system the operating system I'm running has. Right. So we want we want the Z the ZFS computing to happen on the host for sure, not because then that'll decrease the amount of uh, network traffic is created to the iSCSI volume unless unless we don't use zfs at all for that wait are you running zfs on top of iSCSI in the host well i'm i'm just asking what the you know what the uh, you, what what the most efficient thing to do would be if i wanted to like what if i wanted compressed bits to um, go over the over the wi network wire like would that be a good idea or would it not be a good idea um, in my opinion, it would be a better idea because your compression will have a hard time compensating for the redundancy you have to write out and the scrubbing and so on. So I would pr think it's better to have ZFS provide the uh, iSCSI target, whatever shape it takes, instead of having multiple targets and then running ZFS on top of that. Right, so the... I so would... The, I, I apologize. Go ahead. No, you go ahead. I, 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 just, think, I, agree, my I, I agree with Jan here. Um, in the environment I run, I have uh, what I consider large-scale ZFS servers that hand out storage via NFS or iSCSI. Um, and the the client VMs on the hypervisors only run something like UFS or EXT4. Um, I have found over the years that you don't want to run any uh, compression or other fancy algorithms on the hypervisor. It's a waste of CPU time. It increases yeah. latency also. Well, as that 4 can be fast enough that because of the early cutoff during compression, so if the first quarter of a block doesn't compress, LZ4 as implemented in ZFS abandons the block for compression, so the 
latency hits for writes isn't too high because almost always you will get the computed CPU cycles back in bandwidth saved. True, but that is a host CPU operation that's, I guess, perhaps taking exits or not. And is that doing it per block or it per file? So it's not constant. You know, how, how frequent is that? DFS block whatever that means in your setup. Per record size of the file. Uh, exactly, yeah. per, per ZFS record. So um, let's say you have a Z wall. If it has a logical block size for the for the block device exposed to user space, but uh, if a block compresses well enough, it gets stored in less physical blocks on the backing storage devices. Correct, no question. But then, if if your uh, record size is one megabyte, is it doing the early abort test for the twelve point five percent? Compression, com compressibility on each record, each one megabyte record? Yes. Okay. Which is what you want. But if yeah. you have, have such a high uh, block size uh, or volume uh, record size or whatever the property oh. is called, I forgot the exact name. Um, vol record size or something or vol block size? Uh, vol block size, I believe. Well, we can bump my example down to like 64. K, which but, is pretty um, common, or 32K, let's say. Yeah, 32. 32 and 64 are totally yeah. reasonable. There you go. So let's say um, 64K, and it does the CPU does a valid, it, uh, a compressibility check on every yes. record. On every written record. Every written record. But that's not the problem. But if you bump it to one megabyte, it te probes with one megabyte block each time, which does oh. add a bit of uh, <laughs> compute to your I.O. path. Okay. Um, yeah. And so, John, you're saying you've seen just that, that however small that overhead is, it does trickle up to the centralized hypervisor and so the, 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 repeat it enough times and it becomes an issue? So Jan may disagree, and I'm not 100% sure I understand the environment he is working within. The amount of compression testing you do is a constant plus C. It doesn't matter whether you're doing one record of a megabyte or you're doing, uh, you know, 10 records of a hundred thousand of a hundred K mm -hmm. it's going to be the same percentage. Um, and what? what I had said earlier is I simply don't do that on the hypervisors. I don't want to waste the CPU. So all of the data gets sent via whatever the transport is, back over to our file server, which is running ZFS, where all of that takes place. Welcome, Thomas. Um, so I agree, if you have enough network bandwidth, just throw it on the network and let the storage server handle it, keeping the CPU cycles of the VM host available yep. for guest computation, because you don't want to tie up your VM host running anything other but a guest you don't want it crunching LZ4 or ZSTD. Right? Uh, yes, uh, yes, that, that tends to be my approach. Have but you tried disabling I, compression? With compression on the VM host. Uh, on the VM what itself? Is, uh, basically, if you have very large blocks, you uh, add this to the effective write I.O. latency. So let's say I have a one megabyte block I want to write and I do compression at the host, the VM host that is, then um, it starts crunching on the one megabyte buffer and the buffer can't go out to the network until it has been compressed or abandoned as uncompressible. So each record stays longer in the queue which ah. effectively uh, increases your write uh, latency, especially for the writes you care about, like synchronous small writes. I still, instead, I would recommend against using such a large record size if you care about latency. It can be okay for throughput. Yeah. 
Mm. So in this case, just have a network bandwidth to your storage. Yep. Oh, welcome, Thomas. So uh, another go ahead, another please. dimension that I'm thinking about with this is for for Linux. You know, I think I think Linux insists on on disk caching, and Windows insists on not disk caching. If it detects that it's in a VM. So, you know, that, that might, I think, I think that would, that could, you know, decide on, on, you know, what, what architecture is the, is the best for the job. Um, um, cause, yeah, cause I, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure that's right. I'm pretty sure Windows insists that it, I mean, I'm sure there's a workaround, but it'll insist well, not to use any, any disk caching at all. Oh, it detects that it's in a VM and makes a decision and shuts it shuts the cache cache off. Yeah. Oh, I, you I have any details this. on that? I'd love to see them. Go ahead. So I think you're referring to opportunistic locking on Windows. Mm, I'm blocks, talking what? about cache. I mean, I'm no, talking the, about the, like five uh, buffer cache. Yeah, but opportunistic yeah, locking controls a lot of that under the covers. So that's not going to be. Are you saying that's not going to be a problem in either? I didn't say it. I didn't say it won't be a problem. I said opportunistic locking is a knob on top of a bunch of things under the covers that will affect that. I went round and round with Microsoft about ten years ago with this. Don't quote that. Please. <laughs> so, okay. So there's, so there there's probably some tuning that might need to be done. In Windows, now, I, I will say that with Arc off, uh, with you know, uh, if, if we're talking about a single, and I know that John, you don't you don't do this, but if it's a single hypervisor with on disk CFS, turning on Arc is, you know, changes the changes the server from a dream to a nightmare. Um, uh, for the double buffering, correct? So yeah, as Jan yeah. pointed out, primary cache equals metadata, just so you're not just mm, well, saving it out. You need no, you need you need cache, you need cache primary cache all because oh. Windows doesn't for do Windows, cache. But for normal operating systems. Ah. But for normal operating systems, then of course you turn primary cache metadata. But yeah, that's so and I I mean maybe there's a maybe there's a workaround. Like I have a I have, an, I have a single server install right now that's a MySQL database on Windows. Why is that? Because the vendor wants it that way. Yeah. Nothing I can do about it. So, you know, and then they want an enormous amount of RAM, which means that I don't want to spend extra RAM on Arc, but Windows refuses to turn its, its well, at least the checkbox is showing me that the cache cannot turn on whether I use Vert.io, whether I use NVMe, really? uh, it's it's not giving me the option now. I'm sure there's a magic way to to resolve that, and I, I will resolve it. But are you running local pools with uh, with cache devices? Uh, I'm sorry. On you... which system are you using cache devices, uh, John? What, what what do you mean? Clarify. So my, under, so my understanding is what you said was you're running a local uh, system with ZFS with a VM under Beehive. And my ask is, is the pool that you're placing the VM image on, does it have cache devices? Uh, like a, like no, a no, but it has a, it has a, it has a log device and it has 128 gigabytes of arc assigned. Okay. So, so I is mean, a slog I, device you're saying? Just to clarify. Oh yeah, a slog okay. plus yeah plus 128 gigs of RAM that's reserved for arc. I mean reserved. I'm I'm just not using. I set the max arc to 128, and I don't touch it beyond that point. Sure. So yeah, so I mean that means the entire pretty much the entire VM can happily live in, in memory, but what it would probably be better if Windows was using its own caching 
actually it's unclear whether whether or not that's true but because because i get the compressed cache with cfs and i would not with windows well ca caching caching i'm sorry caching is different than having to write out a, a block of data from your sql database you know for instance when a commit operation is executed you don't want, you do not want the SQL server to do caching. That That's our enemy, typically. Now, maybe I'm misunderstanding your question or your environment. Uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, if you go on the, if you go on the MySQL website, they tell you what tunables to set for ideal, you know, uh, ZFS, uh, ZFS back to environments. And there aren't, there aren't too, there aren't too many to flick. And the, you know, the, the trade-off is, is whether you think MySQL knows more about what's going on in its database or whether the compressed memory, which is handled much more efficiently with, you know, with ZFS, assuming MySQL is also compressed, uh yeah th th this is this is absolutely a recommended uh environment site you know set the blocks the right size put on zfs compress the blocks and you get a uh, mysql server with monstrous performance mm -hmm. so but the, the addition of a vm complicates ah, this a bit okay, okay. so what are the key issues arising in when virtualized? Uh, well, I mean, I guess the question is whether I just allow it to, you know, allow some allow it to use some arc or not. Uh, it seems like a waste of memory to give the the M a ton of memory, and then also give it arc. That seems like right. a double buffering problem that's that's going to happen. But if Windows is telling me that it's not caching at all, then that does seem like the right choice. So if I remember correctly, MySQL is uh, the complete opposite of Postgres in that it tries to do all the caching in user space, not you trust the operating system file system cache. I agree with Jan. And it is a big multi-threaded process Whereas something like Postgres forks one worker per connection and shares the potentially very effectively compressed ZFS buffer cache, um, which can have a great payoff. But uh, for MySQL, you have to have enough RAM available. And have to, if, have, if you're using MySQL and ZFS under real load, it's important that the arc size is restricted to keep the memory available for MySQL. Because you don't want MySQL periodically triggering the system memory pressure, uh, which then in involves the back pressure mechanism, which then shrinks the arc, which blocks writes, and so on. So you can, can get the this really oscillating performance. Instead, you have to define the memory split. Does that make sense? Understood. Anything else related to that? It's very much one of the key long-term questions, so it's not like we'll solve it in one day. But uh, thank you very, very much for those insights. Has anyone exp uh, just stumbled over it, reading man pages? Has anyone tried using uh, geom cache between the Z wall and uh, Beehive to force it to uh, always use correctly aligned reads and writes so if, uh, to work around if the blocks are uh, the. So the partition table isn't properly aligned and the block sizes aren't integer multiples of each other. Helping only when your partition table is misaligned or all the time? No, it happens if basically 
That's uh, you have yeah. If the, you don't have proper alignment and matching block sizes, if geom caching can so that can fix some of the uh, impact. Ah. Uh. <laughs> I am guessing you're the first person to have considered that scenario, but I do know it was know written. What you'd the name is a bit confusing, which is yeah. why I was confused, because it's uh, was written to help with the rate free implementation, which okay. requires fixed size aligned records for reasonable performance. Let's see. I'm going to see if there's a uh, Gcash. So Gcash. Okay, yes. on the manual page. And if that makes sense to inject between Beehive and the Zvol or iSCSI uh, target you are connected to. John, does that sound like solving a problem or adding a layer that's not that could be buffered and then isn't flushed out the disk and then it's not really it? a cache. It's basically uh, it's a tiny cache, but it's mostly for realigning and padding the read requests. Interesting. <laughs> okay. You know, it was the so only use case for A3. You should the get the push set, so. by using the, lo the lo log. Um, I, I, I have not used this. Neither have I just stumbled over it yeah, following links. Yeah, previous is full of gems. Well, I'm sure it solved the problem at some point. Interesting. Okay. Anything else on this topic at this time? It's a lifetime topic, which is great. And documentation and best practices should get out there eventually. So, uh, if not, I have a super quick one. Alan Jude posted on IRC top dash capital S H lowercase Z shows the CPU usage for the Vert IO net. Uh, for devices and John, this sounded like your type of work um, where, hey, if your Vert IO net device is maxed out, you're maxed out. Yeah. Um, the, the, this was in response to my question. I feel my numbers sound reasonable. Yes. And he just told me what to check for, uh, which is yes, the Vert IO net driver maxing out one uh, CPU. Uh, core with its fat. Was that the case? Uh, yes. Ah. And the workaround was? There is no workaround. That's okay. the current design limitation. Got it. To push wood with brute force, we need multi-queue using multiple threads. Yep. Uh, to um, become more efficient, we need more batching and maybe something like TSO and LRO uh, emulation. So back to your dream multi queue tap device. Something like that. It wouldn't have to be a tap. Okay. I think uh, the Veil stuff claims to support some of the offloading. So at least the code says that it does set the flex that it supports TSO, LRO, and so on. So that may help if you have a setup which looks like that. Oh. Okay. Uh, moving on, welcome Thomas. He had reached out to me noticing that certain devices were uh, queuing up packets like mad. And before you joined, Jan explained that, well, any application like that should have a tunable inside no, of itself. No, it's not a not tunable. A, well, sock up behavior. <laughs> Go ahead and, and explain I expect what you that observed. something as old and mature as Mumble does that. Okay. Uh, Thomas, do you want to describe what you saw and how you measured it? And you're muted. Unless I have a different Thomas. He's muted. Yep. Hello? Hello. Can you hear you? Okay, good. You can hear me now. So I'm noticing in one mumble in Prosody that. Uh, a lot of users can't actually connect. And if I look in my D message, I see something about um, the connection is um, saying that there's already too many in the queue. 
Uh, and I've tried increasing the kernel backlog queue to, from 128 to 4096, and it's still an issue. And um, just the amount of connections from um, HA proxy, which is a load balancing reverse proxy, just checking the, doing the TCP layer four checks is enough to cause the uh, entire system to be backed up to the point where it can no longer accept more connections. And the, um, I looked into Netstat and whenever this is happening, there's a whole bunch of uh, TCP connections stuck in the closed state. Uh, for the, for whatever uh, program is is backing up at that particular moment. Um, okay, this is completely different uh, kind of runs from, from what Michael described. So yes, what you're ahead. encountering is that on the listening TCP socket, there's the so-called backlog, which is how many incoming connections this kernel will buffer on the socket uh, for the listening server to uh, accept and if it overflows you get the message at backlog overflow to demask uh, which is, yeah exactly listen queue overflow in addition to that um, I was having this issue with prosody when it was also set to use select um, um, and when I changed it to use event yep. the issue stopped but there's a new issue where whenever you stop prosody inside of a jail when it's using uh, event, it kernel panics the host. The okay, jail that's host. a big problem, which is a kernel bug and should be fixed yesterday. But other than that, um, basically the problem with uh, select is that uh, it uses fixed size bit sets. So it can only track up to 1024 file descriptors on FreeBSD and most other operating systems by default. Uh, because the bit set only has 1024 bits, it can only track the first 1024 file descriptors. If you have more than those, you can't add them to the set and your whole, either your application is well written and will refuse to do this or maybe it try, tries it and then just completely desynchronizes because no, suddenly it's confused that oh why am i not getting readiness notification for this file descriptor yeah well, because it can't be part of a set of file descriptors to be notified about kq doesn't suffer from this problem it efficiently scales to tens or even hundreds of thousands of file descriptors and yeah, but this the, doesn't... Application, the problem is that using select, you can't support more than 1,024 file descriptors per process. This this happens on Mumble when I have only have like five users. Yeah, it could be that for some reason, Mumble doesn't completely close the file descriptor, maybe because it's... One possible solution explanation would be if the Mumble protocol expects the client to speak first and your HA proxy doesn't speak, maybe Mumble doesn't close the socket and there is some middle box in between which uh, kind of breaks the TCP uh, connection shutdown or some firewall on either system. But can you control half close the connections would be the, uh, an explanation for this. Can you run SOC start uh, dash four uh, six C? Um. Yeah. One moment. Four six C. Uh, but this isn't uh, Beehive specific, so I'm a bit wondering. Go ahead. Uh, it's an overflow from yesterday's jail call. So, ah, okay. Thomas, is that the correct correct PR where you? It was the two choice of two settings in a jail, but then one causes an instant panic. Forget what the two were. Yeah, I think that's it. Okay, what were the two modes you can choose between? Um, under Prosody's network handling section, you can yep. choose between um, select and using event and select causes the causes the backlog and cause it to, 
but using a vent causes decay panic if you were to stop the daemon. Okay. Half the battle is just documenting what's going on. Okay. Um... So, so that gives you a backlog, the vent gives you a panic. Ooh. Do you have the ability to control SO linger? Explain what that is for some of us who don't quite haven't heard it. So you have a you, you have a socket and you send data, but that data has not been sent and received by the client. So therefore that socket is yes, it's going to hang around in one of the Finway closing states. And SO linger can can control how long that happens. And I'm I I'm trying to understand what I don't know if this is going to affect his environment, but I'm I'm stating it because it might. But I don't know if he can control this. I don't know. Are there more commands he can run to just collect evidence of what's going on? Thank you, Jan, for sock step. Well, as he's already doing, he's running netstat, and he sees a lot. If he's seeing a lot of stuff hanging around in the closed state, I'll have to lock that to a specific PID because there's a lot of other connections that are um, running up Thomas, the result. I'm seeing that your uh, report is already from February, and you're running thirteen to two. One, uh, did you manage to reproduce this crash on 13.2? Yes. Okay. Um, another question. This would just help narrow down where the bug is. Um, is the F desk FF mounted inside your jail? So slash dev FD? Inside of the jail? Uh, let me check. Because what happens if you unmount this file system or even better never mount it inside the jail? Does it still panic? Maybe it's. No, it's not mounted inside of a jail, but it is mounted outside because um, that IO cage said it wanted right. it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I spell that I'd send out something. Fix it if you can. Because uh, it's in the F desk three uh, FDs. I'm just wondering if this is generic file descriptor handling or if it's inside of F desk FS. Yeah. Looks like uh, your panic message says it's calling exit and then exit calls the, uh, close on the file descriptors. And then da -da -da -da. Yeah, it, f it follows an uh, invalid pointer. Great, uh, yeah. But maybe try adding that in the jail just to see if that satisfies it. Thinking out loud. Yeah, but it shouldn't panic either. No, it definitely shouldn't uh, panic, which is, yeah. This is really a quite bad kernel bug, which Thomas managed to uncover. Let's see where it left off. Oh, Rob Wing. Uh, so if anything, Thomas, feel free to mm -hmm. just spell out the steps to in the simplest yeah. environment to reproduce it, just because so many people have so many moving parts in their systems. Just lay out a real yeah. simple, perhaps on 14, especially with the release coming out. 13 2 is also supported, so... Yeah. But so you really, I would, you would, I would start say... With it. Sorry. All right, Thomas. Um, I th I first thing you do is just install FreeBSD. It can be inside. Apparently, it can be inside of a bare metal or a virtual machine. Second step is to set up IO cage, and then 
create a jail uh, inside of IO cage and install Prosody in it. And then inside of the Prosody config file, uh, there's uh, I link to the documentation and the ticket for how to change the network backend, and then just change it to lib event, you know, start the daemon, and then stop the daemon. Um, and then once you stop the daemon, it should cause the gate panic. Mm -hmm. uh, one quick point. Uh... The developers won't be running IOK. So if you can follow just pretty manual routine jail creation, that would be nice. Which, you know, splat down a file system uh, and off you go, just thinking out loud. Because all the, the nifty user friendly handlers can sweep quite a few things under the rug. And who knows? Okay. Slightly maybe okay. IOK is to blame. And we really don't want to waste time chasing an IOK bug when it's uh, not. No, the con is to blame. Oh, it is to blame, but it's. It's triggered by something, and if, it, for example, it only only triggers under IO page but not a raw jail, that would be kind of fascinating. So go ahead and uh, hopefully you're getting a sense from all this of just how verbosely it's it's helpful to document this exploit. So uh, the problem is that basically how you perform the first two steps in your reproduction guide is really important, I assume, and that's the part you didn't. Uh, Waste any words on? Raise any what? Waste any words on because you just say set up IO cage, set yeah. up a new jail in IO cage. Both times you have lots of options how to configure these. Those are okay. Very on high the, level. Yeah. On and the installing FreeBSD. Yeah. <laughs> I just use the the install disk and set mm -hmm. it up with a ZFS, a Z root. Um, there's not much off of like the standard options that I chose there. Mm -hmm. And then I just, you know, packaged, installed um, IO cage. Okay, fair enough. Uh -huh. What would really be helpful for developers to debug this would be really a take a default installation and then run this shell script. I can probably set up a shell script to replicate it. And if you need any help, reach out to myself. And I'll just, just get, you know, even if it's napkin notes. Uh, and that's, if that's you have a virtual machine to test this in, make sure does it crash if you do it on bare metal or in a virtual machine without jails in the middle? I don't know yet. I haven't tested okay. it on bare, on without jail. Because it could be uh, really a KQ bug and not in any way jail related at this point. Which wouldn't make the bug any less uh, egregious, it would make it worse, but. Yeah, but. So there's some uh, direction on that one. But thanks for finding that. Did you report the, make the initial report? Scrolling up. Uh... Yeah. Okay, great. We appreciate that because this is this is what it looks like. And who knows, that same scenario might impact other daemons. And if that's a landmine, I hope we can keep people from stepping on it. Anything else related to that? Because if not, I would love to hear, Jan, what you have to report from either last week or yesterday on a stack, IP so stackless jail. Okay, um, the setup for this is uh, after the last FreeBSD security uh, patches, I had a renewed interest in defense in depth for Beehive and wanted to uh, finally put Beehive in a jail, which is supported, but uh, that got me thinking how far can I lock down the jail while still being able to run Beehive fully featured um, because Beehive shouldn't be using normal sockets to talk to the network because it uses, in my configuration, tap interfaces. Uh, and the way the Beehive process accesses the tap interface is through the character device, so slash dev tap something. And 
because of that, it shouldn't require any IPv4 or IPv6 sockets, which is why I tried to run it without them inside the jail, so that even if someone gains code execution inside the Beehive uh, jail, uh, they don't have direct access at, uh, network access. They would have to um, know how to read raw ethernet and inject raw ethernet using the tap device and they could only do it through this tap device and couldn't just use the host network stack. And uh, I found out that there's one little blocker and that is that recent-ish versions of Beehive no longer depend on the uh, tap link state up if open so CTL to turn the tap interface link up when you open it with Beehive. Instead, they uh, try to set the um, tab interface uh, link up using a IOCTL on a socket, and that has to be an IP socket, so it still needs an IP, just an IP socket without doing anything but invoke this IOCTL on it. But it turns out that the tab device driver already has basically the same IOCTL under a different number slash name. So I patched that in and now it works. Uh, the code got shorter, does fewer system calls, requires fewer variables. It's all around um, smaller and easier to read the code, but uh, I haven't upstreamed the patch. So Let me do that. Did you say TAP has an IOCTL or a system? Control? Yes, TAP has an IOCTL. The patch word is, uh, let me just dump it in chat if it fits. Yeah. No, it's too long. Um, just so that it doesn't get lost. Good. Oh. Michael, here's the trick question of the day. How do we put stuff like this into a in a, into a patch uh, that can get committed and not sit and get lost in Bugzilla for the next decade? That is the sixty-four, sixty-six thousand dollar question. So I um, have some very clear have thoughts a on that. But committer let's get on speed dial. Committer on speed dial. I've tried that. I uh, know those committers are now at like beyond capacity. So uh, let's quickly look at Jan's code here in the gist. Um, that's your top IOCTL div. Okay. Uh, just one That's second. all the div. Uh, so I don't need the socket. I don't need the interface request struct. Um, because now I can use the uh, same file descriptor used for I for Ethernet I/O. Okay. Uh, the IOCTL has been once upon a time for VMware support <laughs> and implemented on FreeBSD. It's there. It does what we need, <clears throat> and it works without now. And then I can run my. Stuff. So maybe I should just steal your screen share for a moment. Uh, sure. Just one sec. Okay. I'll get, I can address this in a just a, a sec. Uh, John's 54K question. I'll get to that in just a moment, but uh, sure. Let me see if I push some stop share. Go ahead. What you got? Okay. Um. So what I have is. I just need a moment. And I will find some more links for John, which have been so a lot I'll, of thought into this a few years aside. I will just steal the screen share now. Yep. If you, nobody objects. Can you see my terminal window? Yes, sir. Uh, I think this should be a reasonable size. Yep. It's not bad. Do you see just the window? Yes. Only one Mac terminal window. Or Mac okay, Mac. that's good. So here is the jail.conf. What? Uh, so here is how I create a beehive jail. It's a persistent jail with no processes in it. 
and it's only there to set up a read only ZFS data set. So its preparation is basically collect what Beehive needs and create the empty directories as mount points, copy in the relevant files, then copy in the uh, runtime linker, use LDD to find out the libraries Beehive depends on and copy them into the jails slash lib. Install Beehive, set the whole dataset read only and snapshot it. And then per VM here, I don't, this is no longer a persistent one, that's fine. Um, I have to assign it a unique uh, DevFS rule set number. I said which um, volumes are supposed to uh, be made available to it. And basically here it does a read-only clone, so it's still immutable and completely deduplicated. Okay, for uh, the less than 10 megabytes, this is overkill, but still it's nice to see that it, it's possible. I create a mount point here to hold the hypervisor state, so the EFI variables. Um, then generate the beehive configuration file which is fairly basic. It's just uh, make randomness and ethernet available, use a renamed tab interface, assign it a MAC address, uh, Yeah, which uh, come target layer port to use. We want uh, legacy serial ports and the boot ROM and the variable files and four serial ports. Just because why not? So now I have to, because it's a jail, I have to bring the system into a clean state. So I just try any existing virtual machine, run a small shell script to give me a CTL port with no uh, LUNs accessible, um, make these LUNs accessible, or these ZFS um, volumes available as uh, CTL LUNs um, on the port I've just created. Yeah. Then generate the DevFS rule set and apply it. Here I mount the file systems. And in case the file system was already mounted, I make sure to reapply the new rule set in case anything changed. Or apply a few uh, resource limits on the number of file descriptors and processes. So, because there will always be a beehive process in there when there's an attacker inside the jail. So, it's enough to restrict it to one process to make sure that the attacker can never fork. They could only exec, which, uh, if they have code execution and are clever enough, uh, isn't a privilege escalation to them. So then I run Beehive inside the jail, pass in the MAC address and uh, vidIO SCSI port, which is then expanded in the configuration. Post stop, I just destroy the VM to get back the gigabytes of memory. Uh, and on release, I also unmount the file systems and remove the restriction, uh, the resource limits. So, and at runtime, this looks like this. So here you see the output. This here is fine because the port already exists. And here's my virtual machine because I just repackaged uh, one I already had. Ah. Which dummy password did I put in? Okay. Uh, I don't remember the dummy password I put in for the root user. But hey, so this is what I see here. It's still running 13.1 inside, yes, I know. But I was too uh, stingy with the storage to easily upgrade the system right now. Yeah.
that's it. And with this patch, I can run with neither IPv4 nor IPv6 accessible directly. Only the device. So if I go in here, you can see that only the min minimal set um, of devices is visible. Okay, how far is that patch from being a review? Uh, someone throwing them into the fabricator far away. Okay. It's now, the code is ready to be used. It's it do does you everything. Hmm? Do you have a Do you have an account on Fabricator? Yeah, I, and I have patches lingering there. Okay. Uh, but so let's see. Did anyone respond? No, no updates on the WireGuard RC.T script. Oh, yeah. So this, that's it. Cool. Oh, thank you for that. Okay. Cool. Uh, I found what I'm looking for. Hmm? I found what I'm looking for. Uh, yeah. Okay, then go ahead and stop your share. If that I have. You thank you, sir. I'm, I'm looking at eight places at once. My apologies. Okay, but yeah. any questions I, for Jan on that? Uh, so what's the missing is uh, easy to use scripts to dynamically create the come target layer port and manage. Uh, Ah, uh, yeah, but what about mapping prior between to that? port your, and LAN? But yeah, that's, that's icing on the cake. What about your jail creation that you just showed us? Is that something you can share at this point, or is it still the jail configuration? Uh, yes, uh, that Go that part works. What's missing, basically, is would be part of a pre-start or a prepare yeah. hook. Okay, uh, Godspeed so, on those, and we look forward to playing with because it. Because right now uh, you have to uh, statically pick a port number for your phys uh, CTL physical port number, which, yeah, it's not nice to have to assign the unique numbers in your configuration files just because the tooling isn't there to dynamically allocate them. Okay. Anything else? Any questions for Dion? It looks very nice. Good work. I second that. Okay. So, uh, to answer your question, John. All right. I have confirmed, hands on, painfully, <clears throat> that number one, our uh, good. Uh, let's do it in kind of reverse order. So looking at what Thomas brought to the table today, uh, number one is good problem reports. And the documentation on that is okay, but not great. Uh, you do want to be super verbose. You want the message output. You want exact version because some people have reports that are no, I'm not looking at you. Yama, so it's like, hey, on free BSD, Samba doesn't work. It's like, that's not very helpful. So there are key points of verbosity to get in there. This is um, not bad, but uh, writing a problem report, there's like two sentences as a suggestion. So that's to be addressed uh, as a group. Go ahead, Jan. The next part, continue yes. reading. Yep. The tips and tricks. Oh, very nice. Yes, good. Yeah, it is. Great. Do not leave the summary empty. A weak summary line. Yep. If you have a patch, say so. I like that. Yes. Uh, if you're the maintainer, maintainer, say so, be specific. Oh, good. This is, yeah, quite good. Uh, if you've mucked with your build environment, say so. <laughs> because oh, yes. having developers chase wild gooses, to use one phrase, is just not going to get you ever to a second bit of their attention. Uh, 
avoid controversial requests. Okay, we shall see. Be polite. That's a good one to end on. Uh, yes, check if someone else has found it. Uh, with like Santiago, we're finding all sorts of NIC issues, and those NIC issues can be SRIOV issues, they can be pass through issues, they can be a number of things. So do your homework on uh, finding what even you think might be related, but aren't sure, just say, hey, it might be this, might not be this. Any questions relating to that? And I, suggestions, so, we can get to suggestions so, from the time comes. Yes. You're kind of answering what I was what I was hoping to ask, and maybe I didn't ask it well enough. So for instance, um, Jan has a, a modification to the- yep, I'm uh, getting there. Number okay. three is reviews. Okay. So, and I said in reverse order. So let me just run through these super quick. Okay. Uh, crash reporting. Uh, this handbook chapter is what in fact pushed me over the edge to pursue becoming a FreeBSD docs committer. Uh, the fact that the syntax was pushed around for years and then uh, Robert Watson said, this should be completely rewritten years ago, uh, just pushed me over the edge. So crash reporting was a nightmare a few years back because when network dumps and then encrypted dumps and then all these different components came simultaneously <clears throat> developers weren't quite aware what the other developers were working on and suddenly uh encrypted dumps uh, network dumps died instantly the moment if lib came along so all the work went out the window rocks work specifically and then encrypted dumps came and then all these different angles on reporting uh, came and were often conflicting. So Sam Guider did a rather good presentation on, with my help, on the history of crash dumping, because we were like, hey, we really should get this right and document it because it's not there. So he wrote a proper paper, and the, oh, it's not, it's linking the slides, but not the paper. The Asia BSDCon site might have the paper linked. And so that documentation cannot be too easy or accessible. And then finally, tips on good reviews and the handbook is not bad about it. Let's take a look. So pre-commit reviews. Something that has come up repeatedly on Beehive is that developers lump quite a few little changes into one giant change thinking, hey, let's get it in there. Well, the best strategy is to in fact break that down into the smallest a la carte reviews as possible that can be reviewed individually. And then, you know, the the mega feature arrives that depends on all those with all of those in place. So Corbin's made huge progress in uh, breaking up his reviews and it's working. So uh, that this call has you know, seen firsthand. So uh, here's more on, on that. Now, if it's not clear what a piece of code does, it will not get attention. If it's not clear what versions it runs on, it won't get attention. If if you haven't done your homework on testing it, well, someone just cruising by will not want to do that homework, trying to read your mind of what the implications may be. So, uh, John, for me, it's come down to these three points and they've not been, they've not achieved a Zen enlightened state. They're good, but not yet great. And I, I almost think that this type of documentation should be in in base manual pages so that one doesn't have to go pop out to uh, the handbook or otherwise to find it and then find perhaps neglected information there. I think things like the crash reporting all forms should be ridiculously clear, which I'm, I'm sure there are manual pages that cover some of it, but uh, that's important. And of course, things like reviews and all have changed a bit with the move to Git. And so people look at it differently and we're distracted by that migration. And I know that OpenBSD has, I believe it's send bug. Does FreeBSD have a send bug at the command line where you just say, hey, make it easy. Uh, Jan, you would probably know this. Uh, and send bug one, and then they have their own problem report box. Uh, nope. As far as I know, FreeBSD doesn't have a BSD send comparable tool. Bug one, uh, note the OpenBSD PR guidance. So 
that said, John, is out of touch of what you're after. Because I've noticed that if you get any of these wrong, that's it. And notice that on the jail call, the group successfully resurrected a GSOC project from 2019 that pretty much had a oh, you know, manual page issues. They're a non-native English speaker, and it just sat saying, hey, manual needs some help. And it it was accepted, yet needed that touch up. And that simple point is what kept it sitting from 2019 to 2023. So not that I have any opinions on this. I am simply sort of, I am picking on the piece of code that, that Jan modified to use the IOCTL. Yes. And it's not a bug fix. If anything, it's a feature, and it's a feature that Jan needs to put together a piece of code that will work better for the entire community. Yep. I have found that to be very hard to do. Hmm. So lo uh, lobbying it, for PRs has been a challenge? It doesn't, well, it, but it doesn't fall into the category above. It's not a bug, but you still need an issue tracker, which is commonly called a bug tracker. I, I get it. Trust so me. It's a it's, so it's a review, not a PR, correct? Mm. No, not really. Not in my opinion, but that's me. We have that's the uh, mechanism we have. I, we have I, two <laughs> tools. We have the older bug track, bugs.freebsd.org, and we have the reviews. Um, reviews are normally the way for new features, whereas the bug track is mostly used for bug fixes and some all of ports. Except for the big port uh, infrastructure changes. Take those to the perhaps architecture mailing list, which sometimes is super quiet. Um, although, John, did you say that this would have worked before the TAPIF open nifty syscontrol things? And then um, that got in the way? So you could consider probably, it a uh, because you been doing uh, this it is the only. That. No, it used to be that Beehive just uh, Beehive just expected the user to set the sysctl top uh, if open making the up if open or something. Yeah. Uh, that you either set it or have some user space script being part uh, to uh, turn the uh, top interface up just if config name up. If you didn't want to yep. set the CDL. Yep, yep, yep. And so a while ago, um, this feature came in to uh, clean up and don't uh, make assumption of the global system configuration, which is nice and all, but it also means that this was the one place Beehive required the use of an IP socket. Uh, which is no longer possible if you disable IPv4 and IPv6. Correct. So my point is that perhaps we could frame it and yes, keep in mind, I mean, it as developers are far more emotional than you, they give credit to. They're, they think they're Vulcan logicians, but hey, it's actually quite emotional. It's important how you frame things. So maybe this is a regression. Thank you very much is my point. So there's the proper name of, I believe, of the tap on open syscontrol. Yeah, uh, So exactly. So, so it's a valid question. Uh, is this technically a regression? A regression, to say it clearly. Uh, For that, you would have to look up the timeline. Okay. Well, when the VMM became open... available in jails versus when was this uh, committed? So yeah, if there was ever a window where VMM was available in jails, but mm -hmm. Beehive didn't That's a good uh, point, use but... a socket, then you have a window where it would have worked, so it would be a regression relative to this uh, window in the commit history. Yes, uh, I, I love your pedantic take on that, which is correct. That is exactly it. So, yeah. Um, so, uh, I, I do understand the position on release engineering that, okay, look, everyone, we have to have a features freeze for 14 because, hey, let's, it'll yeah. never happen if we always yeah, have our new G Yeah, framing but... it as a regression would really help getting it in late. That's my point on just, it's a, it's a, a PR report that the OS prevents something, 
prevents the operator from doing something on the mm -hmm. OS within base tools. So uh, to me, that can be plausibly considered a problem yes. report. Framing and here's it as the a patch. regression is a good way to sneak in last minute. I wouldn't say sneak, but then navigate. Yes, navigate it is in. sneak. Okay. So are you willing to pursue that uh, problem report? Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, this, I think, was left over from before. Uh, John, I had a super quick question that I mailed you, and maybe you responded, but I've just hit my computer. I already... Uh, you responded? Last night. Oh, you are great. Thank you, Daniel, who had to run. Uh, just for everyone, for what it's worth, I've seen a system where inactive memory is off the charts. The system starts uh, uh, paging and eventually tipping over. So maybe John has some tips on chasing that down. Let's see. Anyway, other topics while we're at it. I see your mail. Thank you for that. Okay. Okay. We are how far? Oh, we are at a Moose Jaw, an hour and a half from start time or from Portland towards Ottawa. Oh, fine. So Jason Tupner, who's off to a desert biking event, uh, did a quick brain dump on his essentials in his environment, which is well documented in BSD CAN, Asia BSD CON, and Beehive CON talks, quite a cool early production environment. So on screen, it's like, hey, he really wants to make sure this works. I hope I'm still sharing. Yes, I'm still screen sharing. Um, and then here is his VM Beehive config. And John, we don't have Santiago, but we have you. Are any of your NIC related issues making progress? I have not actually looked at them. I have new I have new systems coming in probably okay. in another couple of months that will give me an opportunity to readdress. Cool. So one bit of progress was that uh, Santiago found this Red Hat PR that sure sounded like the, I believe AM, yeah, AMD PCI pass through issue. So they are being bitten. So we may be facing a Supermicro BIOS bug. Yay. <laughs> so that's the kind of thing to talk about. Thomas, did that inspire any questions on your part? No, um, not right now. Can you go back down? What was that Red Hat uh, problem yeah. number? I'm okay. sorry. Yeah. Yeah, and, enough. No, no, no. No apologizing, dude. Uh, keep in mind that, and did I actually get the number? Uh, uh, oh, Red Hat PR. No, there's a no number. Let me, let me open that bad boy up. Uh, that is solution verified. Uh, that number right here. Five. And, you read that for me? In, nope. I'll put it in chat. Uh, so okay, and thank you. The thank docs, you. Of course. So note that this requires uh, a subscriber status. So uh, Red Hat PR, the number is just, just put the link in. That's fine. Oh no, for the but the minutes are helpful to others. So PR that. Okay. So here's a snapshot. Uh, maybe that's impacting you. Maybe not. But let's try to narrow in on all of these because we have phrases like "please, please, please fix this by 14." Please, please, please. Okay. Um. Anything else at this time? Thank you. 